Why are modern physicists so confident in the correctness of Einstein's special theory of relativity? The answer is simple, because it is incredibly well supported by experiments. After all, experiments are the main criteria for determining the accuracy of our understanding of the universe. In the 125 years since the inception of the special theory of relativity, various aspects of it have been successfully tested by nearly a hundred different experiments. Nevertheless, there is still a vast number of enthusiasts on the internet persistently trying to prove that Einstein was wrong. Perhaps this is because it's quite challenging to find consolidated and easy to understand descriptions of experiments confirming the theory of relativity in one place on the internet. It's high time to rectify this unfortunate oversight, and that's precisely what we'll do in this video. Subscribe to the channel, and let's get started soon. The fundamental postulate underlying the theory of relativity is the assertion of the constancy of the speed of light in a vacuum, and its independence from the velocity of both the source and the observer. In other words, the speed at which light from a car's headlights propagates is the same for both the driver and a pedestrian standing on the sidewalk. By the way, this postulate was not initially formulated by Einstein. The first thought about the constancy of the speed of light dates back to the late 19th century, expressed by the French physicist Henri Poincaré. Einstein's key contribution was being able to coherently connect this postulate with another, even more venerable historical postulate. That physical processes in all uniformly and rectilinearly moving frames of reference, occur identically. In the theory of relativity, the constancy of the speed of light is postulated, meaning it's not proven. Nonetheless, when making a claim in physics, we must attach experimental or observational evidence to it. And for the postulate of the constancy of the speed of light, such evidence certainly exists. The simplest way to demonstrate that the speed of light is independent of the source's velocity is by observing binary star systems. Stars in these systems orbit a common center of mass, so each star approaches and recedes from us at different times. If the speed of light depended on the source's velocity, it would mean that a star emits faster light when moving towards the observer and slower light when moving away. With a specific relationship between the star's distance and its orbital speed, a situation would arise where the faster light emitted at a later time would overtake the slower light emitted earlier. This would lead to binary stars showing a particular change in brightness over time, or what astronomers call their light curve. The first systematic study of the light curves of binary stars, like Beta Lyrae, was conducted by the Dutch astronomer Willem de Sitter in 1913, who, however, did not find the expected brightness fluctuations. Subsequently, de Sitter's measurements were repeated several times with ever-increasing precision. For example, Kenneth Brecker in 1977 showed no change in the speed of light from a binary star, with an accuracy of up to two parts in 10 million. In 1926, the German physicist Rudolf Tomaszek, using an instrument known as an interferometer, measured the speeds of light coming to Earth from various celestial objects, such as the Sun, Moon, Jupiter, Sirius, Arcturus, and so on. Despite these objects being at different distances from Earth and moving at different speeds relative to it, the speed of light coming from them was the same. In 1956, Soviet physicists Bonk Bryevich and Malchanov carried out an experiment envisioned by academician Vavilov to measure, also using an interferometer, the speeds of light coming from opposite ends of the solar disk. As the sun rotates, one edge approaches the observer, and the other recedes. The difference in speeds is about 5 km per second. If the speed of light depended on the source's velocity, the difference in the speed of light from different parts of the sun could be measured. However, the speed of light from different edges of the sun turned out to be the same. Since the mid-20th century, thanks to the advent of powerful accelerators of charged elementary particles, it became possible to conduct direct experiments to measure the speed of light from moving sources. In 1977, at the Ukrainian Institute of Physics and Technology in Kharkiv, physicists Gladke, Mazmanishvili, Reprintsev, and Filipov conducted an experiment to directly compare the speeds of light from a moving and a stationary source. The moving source was an electron, rotating almost at the speed of light inside a particle accelerator. As we know, all accelerated charged particles emit electromagnetic radiation, and circular motion is a special case of uniformly accelerated motion. So, the electron in the accelerator tube acted as a moving source of electromagnetic radiation. The radiation from the electron was captured through special windows in the walls of the ring, and then directed to a detector through two different paths. In one path, the light went directly to the detector, while in the other, at a certain distance from the window, 
it was intercepted by a special transparent plate, which thus became a secondary stationary source of radiation. In simpler terms, if the speed of light depended on the source's velocity, then along the first path, the light would travel at a speed depending on the source's velocity all the time, eventually reaching the detector in T1 divided by C plus V1 seconds. In the second case, it would first travel to the plate at a speed of C plus V2, and then from the plate to the detector, at a speed of C, thus reaching the detector after L2 slash C plus V plus L3 slash C seconds. By the difference in the time of signal passage, one could conclude whether the speed of light depends on the source's velocity. However, in reality, no discrepancy was found. Light propagated as if it was at the same constant speed c, all the time in both cases, indicating the independence of the speed of light from the source's velocity. Later, in 2011, at the Kurchatov Center for Synchrotron Radiation, the same experiment was repeated with a slightly different implementation and much greater precision by a group of scientists led by academician Yevgeny Alexandrov. The result was exactly the same. One could list at least a dozen more experiments and observations that confirm the postulate of the constancy of the speed of light. I've chosen just the most prominent, interesting, and understandable ones. Thus, the postulate of the constancy of the speed of light and its independence from the velocity of the source can be considered proven. But what about the theory of relativity itself derived from this postulate, and the effects predicted directly by it, such as relativistic time dilation of moving objects. This effect has also been repeatedly tested and fully confirmed experimentally. Of course, it was not easy to do this. Because at achievable speeds on Earth, of the order of hundreds of meters per second, these effects are negligible. For example, to make clocks moving at a speed of 100 meters per second, lag behind stationary ones by one second they would need to be continuously moved for approximately 700,000 years. Nevertheless, scientists managed to find clocks capable of moving at nearly the speed of light. They turned out to be elementary particles, for which time dilation was manifested in an increase in their average lifespan. One of the first particles to experimentally demonstrate the time dilation effect was muons, relatives of the familiar electron, with the same electric charge but more than 200 times greater mass, and an average lifetime of about two millionths of a second. These two millionths of a second should be understood not literally, but in a statistical probabilistic sense, each specific muon can live both more and less than this time. However, if we observe a certain group of muons with a starting number n0, over some period of time, their quantity n will change according to this law, where the magnitude tau is called the lifetime. But this is for stationary muons. If muons are in motion, According to the special theory of relativity, time for them should relativistically slow down according to the classical formula, and the observed lifetime of these muons must increase. In nature, we mainly encounter the so-called atmospheric muons, which are born in collisions with atoms and molecules of the Earth's atmosphere. By the so-called cosmic rays, streams of high-energy photons and other particles flying to Earth from space. The speeds of muons produced in such collisions often exceed 99% of the speed of light, and for such muons, the average lifetime, according to relativity theory, should increase by many times. At a qualitative level, it became clear soon that atmospheric muons are subject to time dilation. The point is that muons are mainly formed in the upper layers of the atmosphere, at an altitude of 15 to 20 kilometers. Even if such muons flew at the speed of light, in the average two millionths of a second allotted to them, they would only be able to travel about 600 meters. In other words, at the Earth's surface, such particles should hardly be detected at all. Yet they were detected in significant quantities. This gave rise to the idea of using the muon decay time as clocks for a quantitative verification of the time dilation effect. Starting from the late 1930s, a series of such experiments were conducted, but we will focus on the most well-known one, the experiment by Frisch and Smith conducted in 1963. A whole small film was made about this experiment, and I'll leave a link to it in the description for those interested. In the Frisch and Smith experiment, the muon fluxes detected on Washington Mountain and in the laboratory of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology were measured and compared. The muon flux was passed through a detector, which was a target made of special plastic. Passing through it, the muon generated a flash, which was detected by a sensitive photodetector. The detector was placed behind a thick steel screen of a known thickness, chosen so that only muons with a speed of over 99.5% could pass through the screen. Muons that had a speed of over 99 hole and 54 hundredths percent passed through the detector, 
while those with speeds ranging from 99.5 to 99.54% got stuck in the detector and eventually decayed into a positron and two neutrinos. The positron's emission was accompanied by a second flash of light, which was detected. Thus, muons with less than 99.5% of the speed of light were not registered in the detector at all, while being stuck in a steel screen, muons with energies greater than 99.54% manifested as a single flash, and muons with energy values between these two values produced two flashes. This is precisely the quantity of such muons that the experimenters counted. By the difference in time between the two flashes, they could calculate the lifetime of the muon trapped in the detector, that is, the stationary muon, which turned out to be 2.2 milliseconds. In the experiment on Washington Mountain, the flux of muons flying at a speed from 99.5 to 99.54% of the speed of light through the detector, averaged 563 muons per hour. After that, the researchers descended from the mountain to the laboratory in Cambridge, located 2,000 kilometers lower, and measured the flux of the same muons here. The 2,000 meters separating the upper and lower laboratories, muons flying at a speed of about 99.5% of the speed of light, would overcome in an average of 6.5 milliseconds. If the muon's lifetime did not depend on its speed of motion, that is, if the effect of relativistic time dilation were absent, then during this time, about 95% of the muons detected at a height of 2 kilometers would have decayed. And instead of about 560 muons per hour, the detector in the lower laboratory should have counted only about 25 per hour. In reality, however, the detector measured much more, on average, 410 per hour. This meant that muons flying at approximately 99.5% of the speed of light, had a lifetime about 10 times longer than stationary muons, so their time was slowed down by about 10 times, just as the relativistic time dilation formula predicted. Later, similar but much more precise experiments were conducted at particle accelerators, where muons and other short-lived particles were studied, artificially accelerated to precisely known speeds close to the speed of light. In 1977, in an experiment led by Bailey, a beam of muons was accelerated in the circular accelerator of the European Center for Nuclear Research, to a speed only 6 ten thousandths of a percent less than the speed of light. Muons made an average of about 100,000 orbits inside the accelerator with a ring radius of 7 meters, which meant that their average lifetime increased by about 30 times compared to the lifetime of a stationary muon, which also perfectly corresponded to the predictions of the theory of relativity for such speeds. In the 1960s and 1970s, at least 17 experiments were conducted to detect an increase in the lifetime of various rapidly moving elementary particles. All of them yielded results that were in perfect agreement with Einstein's theory. You might also wonder, how does all of this look in the reference frame linked to the particle itself, where the particle is at rest? Indeed, in this reference frame, the particle should decay exactly after its designated time, having traveled exactly the designated distance. In other words, the course of events seems different for different observers, which, as it may seem, contradicts the second postulate of the theory of relativity and allegedly refutes it. In reality, there is no contradiction. Because in the experiments described above, the lifetime of particles was measured indirectly, based on the distance they traveled. The greater the distance the particle managed to travel before decay, the longer it lived. In the reference frame linked to the particle itself, the particle is indeed stationary, and its lifetime will be constant. However, in the reference frame linked to the particle, the whole rest of the world is moving relative to it, and from the point of view of such a particle, another effect of the theory of relativity is observed, the effect of length contraction along the direction of motion. In simpler terms, in the muon's reference frame, this muon indeed exists for an average of two millionths of a second, flying an average of 600 meters during this time, again, from its own point of view. However, taking into account the length contraction effect, these 600 meters in the moving reference frame, would correspond to approximately 6 kilometers, for the Frisch and Smith experiment, in the laboratory reference frame. That is, in this reference frame, the particles will travel further, as if they live longer, which is observed in experiments. In the 1960s, atomic clocks appeared, devices accurate enough to directly measure the time dilation effect in a moving reference frame, with a measurement error of the order of one second per million years. This new technology was almost immediately used to verify the time dilation effect. The first to do this were Joseph Haefele and Richard Keating in 1971, who twice circled the Earth, first from east to west, then from west to east, in an airplane with four sets of ultra-precise atomic clocks. The fifth clock was left on Earth, at the United States Naval Observatory in Washington. As a result of the flight, which lasted 65.4 hours in the eastward direction and 80.3 hours in the westward direction, 
the readings of the clock's travelers deviated from the readings of the laboratory clocks by several tens of nanoseconds, taking into account the measurement error of plus slash 10 nanoseconds, exactly as predicted by the theory of relativity. In 2005, researchers from the National Physical Laboratory in the United Kingdom repeated the Haefeli and Keating experiment jointly with the BBC, obtaining a similar result, but with greater measurement accuracy. Another effect predicted by the theory of relativity is relativistic, or Lorentzian length contraction. From the point of view of a stationary observer, the linear dimensions of an object moving at a high velocity should decrease along the direction of motion, the object should flatten relative to its stationary state, or, to put it another way, the distances between moving objects should shrink. Indirectly, this effect, as we mentioned earlier, was confirmed by experiments with accelerated particles when transitioning to the reference frame of these particles. However, directly testing it proved to be difficult, because precise measurement of the linear dimensions of particles, especially those traveling at near light speeds, remains a challenge. Nevertheless, ways to test the effect were found, for example, using so-called free electron lasers. These lasers are used to generate high-frequency laser radiation, in particular, in the X-ray range. The source of radiation in them is fast-moving electrons, which move between rows of magnets with changing polarity. Under the influence of the magnetic field, an electron accelerated to nearly the speed of light begins to move in a wavy trajectory, becoming a source of so-called synchrotron radiation. The frequency of this radiation depends on the frequency of the electron's oscillations along the wavy trajectory, which, in turn, depends on the distance between the magnets. So, it turned out that a rapidly moving electron radiates as if the distance between the magnets and their length from its point of view were less than from the point of view of a stationary observer. In this video, we have discussed not all the methods used at different times for the experimental verification of the theory of relativity, but only the most prominent, interesting, and easy to explain among them. However, even this is more than enough to confidently state, the theory of relativity works, and its formulas possess what physicists call predictive power, that is, with their help, we can calculate the behavior of a hypothetical system, and when we recreate such a system in practice, it behaves exactly as predicted by the theory. Well, that's all that's required of any scientific theory, no matter how strange, illogical, or even contradictory this theory may seem to skeptics, the correspondence to experimental data in science has been and probably will always be the criterion of its correctness. After all, the universe is not obliged to be to our liking, and if you enjoyed this video format, then hit the like button, comment about it, and in our upcoming videos, we'll discuss the experimental evidence for other physical theories, such as general relativity, the Big Bang theory, and more.